sarebbe il sale di casa con te, cioè Stumas, Vida Vladimiris Academy's Presidents, Malatis Stegano, Charles Hetfields, che lo ha fatto di Londres, ma si va in giro per i universi di sabato e il dottor Stolera. Vuole progressare, sarà una parte di Sirci, si sa, la nostra normalità, la sua vita, la sua vita, la sua vita, a tante stagioni di lavoro, i tristes albumi di Manette Sassaus, i suoi amatevi, la Ieri Marcio, che non è un a fare l'Università di Sagrado, l'Università di Sendersi, la Lazio, l'Università di Sendersi, l'Università di Sendersi, di c'è un uscito, da rispetto alla missione, che è da vicino all'università di Sorebashi, a volte ha lasciato un lobby smemorando qui, a fare il sacato di un'università di Sadra, sfida alla linea di Sacademia Shoris, e se non ha un bigurismo, ha un bastardia, sa che si è stato da cazzi, polisiede, sa che non si è stato un istituto, 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 si è stato un Catturi garate di stare in tempo a vedere i tali cis, vedati scelovani, fasi stinati, fasi Casa Puteri, Marmai, Teologhevi, Jogi Florovski, Alexandre Schneemann, Joare Meijenov, Fida Sperdi, Fida Sperdi, Sorella Misituti, Sago Marmeneta, Kjernus Marmeneta, Flav, Kjernus Professori, Dottori, Misimata Vizseva, Dukamuzi, Čak, Erfili, Čvendi Sidi Patiri, Arumivani, Čvendi Universiteti, Stavati o Doktori, Stodeva, Stoek, Mars, la giornata è stata fatta per fare un'attività di Grazie a tutti. 
אם סרסו גדולים בסטנדרט, לא יודע לדעריה, לא ניסה עוד מעט לשקטה. ואם איסטיטוציה קטנה שום דבר, לא נביס עין גרם או שם, עשה קובל, ואיסה רמת מנדל מודס, תביא את הרבה גרמים בזה. זאת אומרת, עשה את הפתעות שם, שם סוכי מודס, ואם איסטנדרט פטרון, איסטנדרט שום דבר, זה עליה נשנה דבר שדגל סגור 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 Սարակոր սիպեսինտա մարդանետ ուրիս սովել աշին։ Միտուկրորում ես Սարականատվերում դասեսել ուրեմա, որենից ամերիկաշի ասելոս, ատաս սրասոս դարդրավետից լիտա, այս էրդերկի անսակությությությությությությությությությությությությու Zavěrný autoritě vysvětlí. Takže zavěrný výdí materiá. Mám se zpravdu ten útěr toho. Takže jde o kvůli výdí materiá. Bez masní zlova. I bylo mě vysvětlí vůbec mám se zpravdu vys. Prezidenty vysvětlí. Vysvětlí i veliký hezvonem zpravdu materiá. Ta nejbohá domýlá. Ta vládu vůbecí vysvětlí. Pro dvou spadí výdí. Միս մանալ հիսելաս, մանալ հիսելանուս չատ մեզվիլս, կարավց է ամանաս ուրեմելի տոգումենտի, դիկոնի, ռոմլիս, կարավց է իրեմաս մի հող ախարի սակրակոս ունեստետիս ագադելում ասարջոն, մի մի նայնցվիս ուղասնումաս, Մարդայն է ուլի սապսում ենք ու ամդանի սպերոշի շետատերի մասակութրան ուլի ծուլիսկիս, սնիլ ավարինի սախելով իս մարդայն է ուլի տեղովորդի սեմինայիս պրեզտենց, մարովիս դեկանով չատ հետվիս, մի ենտրա ախարի voice, 
and writings on secularism have become something fresh in many people's minds. There are a lot of people today who are addressing the work and memory of Father Alexander Schmann, but I am deeply concerned that they're not reflecting Schmann. They're reflecting Schmann in their own image. And in many ways, I think there are those who are trying to hijack Father Schmann and turn him into something which he simply was not. It's very difficult in 2019, 36 years after the falling of sleep of Father Schmemann, to suddenly be remaking him. But there is a reason why these people want to do that. And so I thought what we must begin to do once again is to hear the voice of Schmemann in his own words. Because he is, in so many ways, a contemporary voice. Just as he was when he was doing his own speaking and his own writing. There are so many things I want to say. But I really just want us to hear Schmemann. And then I'm going to do a kind of part two. To show how prophetic his voice was showing the results of what he was predicting in his own time. I didn't have Father Schmemann as one of my own professors, but I certainly claimed him as a teacher, someone who has influenced me in so many ways, through his teaching, through his writing, and through the hearing of his voice. But someone who was close to him, and I was able to be close to, her final years was that of Matryoshka Juliana Schmidt. She was very open and shared many things. One of the things that she shared was how, when Father Alexander was writing, he struggled to get everything absolutely right and precise. You know, he was an incredible link. He was really a Renaissance man. If you look through his library, it wasn't just theological. It was a whole breadth of different disciplines. Academic, beyond. He taught Russian literature, poetry, all these things. But the major portion of his thought was on the rise of secularism and where it will lead us as a culture. So that's why we need to return to and look at and listen to what he was saying, because he really has become a strong prophetic voice in our own day. I'm going to quote, actually, from the preface of his book, The Eucharist. At one point in this lecture, and the reason that I will do that is it really helps me to make the strongest point to you today. Matryoshka Juliana said that of all of his writings, this was the most difficult one for him because he knew the importance of worship and Eucharist. And he had to get it just right. This book actually was finished posthumously after his death. I can tell you as a priest, I often return to this preface to find my own direction again as someone who stands in the central place of worship. Having laid out a foundation for this lecture on Schmann and secularism, let's hear from him. Schmann, in addressing the question of secularism, connected it, of course, to worship. He spoke of worship in a secular age. Remember the times when he was writing. He wrote, quote, to put together in order to relate to them, to one another, the terms worship and secular age seems to presuppose that we have a clear understanding of both of them. That we know the realities they denote, and thus we operate on solid, and thoroughly explored grounds. 
but is this really the case? Unquote. He asked the question because he is convinced that in spite of today's generalized preoccupation with semantics, it's important for us to maintain our vocabulary as Orthodox Christians, to define the terms and the words that we are using. He went on to say, there is a great deal of confusion about the exact meaning of the very terms we use in this discussion. Not only among Christians in general, but even among the Orthodox themselves, there exists in fact no consensus, no commonly accepted frame of reference concerning either worship or secularism and thus the problem of their interrelation. Therefore, Schmemann says, we have to solve the problem. We have to clarify it, and we have to do this, if possible, within a consistent, orthodox perspective. He says, in his opinion, the orthodox, when discussing the problems stemming from our present situations, and remember, he loves in his writings to put things in brackets, our present situations, he would underscore. Of course, the other term that is always peppered in his writings is the phrase, us and bother. So he may been writing about the situations. He says, we Orthodox accept them much too easily in their Western formulations. They do not seem to realize that the Orthodox tradition provides, above all, a possibility and thus a necessity of reformulating these very problems, of placing them in a context whose absence or deformation in the Western religious mind may have been the root of so many of our modern impasses. And, as I see it, nowhere is this task more urgently needed and in a range of problems related to secularism and proper to our so-called age of secularism. Father Schmidt is speaking of the secular age in which you and I are now living. An Anglican Bishop Robert Tuwilliger, once a member of the International Anglican Orthodox Dialogue, predicted that there would become a realignment of Christendom and that traditional Christians across denominational lines will have to regroup and find themselves because there is a coming storm that will hit Christianity hard and that an even Christianity will collapse and it will be a smaller, stronger group of traditional Christians across denominational lines. But Williger stated this, someone raised their hand and asked the question, but surely this does not mean the Orthodox. As I was president, I will never forget his response. He replied, of course it will involve the Orthodox because watch their people. Watch their people, especially in the West, because, as he said, as an outsider, so many of the Orthodox are no longer being formed theologically because the culture in which they have relied on to hold them together is no longer theirs. And that our people, the Orthodox faithful, especially in the West, but not exclusively, are actually being formed by what the Germans call the Zeitgeist. The culture itself is forming both the moral view and the theological mind of our people. Surveys in North America reveal some shocking statistics. Our people, our Orthodox people, are not well informed in their own theological mind. To Willinger was right. Abortion, sex marriage, euthanasia, and many other vexing issues of our day are finding acceptance among Orthodox believers. <coughs> So we can't, as Orthodox Christians, sit in judgment on anybody. Our own house is in crisis, and 
And we have to put that house in order. Now secularism has been analyzed, described, and defined in these recent years in a great variety of ways. But Schmemann says, to the best of his knowledge, none of these descriptions has stressed the point which he considered to be essential and which reveals indeed better than anything else the true nature of secularism. And he says, thus gives the discussion of secularism its proper orientation. So, if you're taking any notes, this is the actual nugget of Schmemann's thought and teaching on secularism. Schmemann defines secularism as quote, above all, a negation of worship, unquote. So there it is. It is a remarkable definition and he goes on to develop it. So when you and I, at this inaugural conference, are looking for how we respond to this tsunami, which is about to hit us so very hard, we turn to Schmemann for guidance. And Schmemann is reminding us to return to the Eucharist, to return to our worship, and to be true and authentic to who we are. As I said, I'm going to draw something out of his preface in the book of the Eucharist to underscore this a little bit later. But Schmemann goes on to say that it's not some kind of transcendence and therefore some kind of religion. He says that if secularism in a theological term is a heresy, it is primarily a heresy about man and not God. Again, that's quite remarkable. And he says, and I quote, it is the negation of man as a worshiping being, as homo adoramus, the one for whom worship is the essential act by which both posits his humanity and fulfills it. It is a rejection as ontologically and epistemologically decisive of the words which always, everywhere, and for all were true epiphany of man's relation to God, to the world, and to himself. It is meet and right to sing of thee, to bless thee, to praise thee, to give thanks to thee, and to worship thee in every place of thy dominion. Unquote. One of the things that we glean from Schmemann is this reality. You and I live in a secularized world which claims that secularism is aesthetic, the absence of God. But I think that we certainly learned a lesson that secularism in our day has in fact become a competing religion. I'm also going to recommend that you explore something. The book is a little off color, so I give you that warning in advance. It's a book that is very popular in Europe at the moment. It's a novel. Its title is Submission by the French author Michel Rubec. And it's about the first Islamic president of France. It is a remarkable read, as I said, a little off in some sections. But the main point for you and for me is this. It is the rise of Islam which is the major concern religiously in the world at this moment. Because secularism is already showing it cannot withstand man's natural attraction for worship and for drawing near to God. And it is Islam that is actually taking the seat in Europe. Secularism is a competing religion. It is not able to withstand Islam. And the other thing that is very clear in this book's submission is this fact. Anemic Christianity will collapse in the face of this onslaught, and so it is important for you and for me as Orthodox Christians to find our way. One of the other things that is important to Schmemann is the recognition that we have been losing the generations in our own households. We have thought that Caesar and our genetic makeup 
would transmit the Orthodox faith. In fact, that is a fallacy. It is not true. In America, the Orthodox are 1% of the U.S. population. What kind of now local culture surrounds our children in the next generation? It is not an Orthodox-based one, and if it is Christian at all, it is a Protestant one. We have to fight all the harder. And that's why I believe Rod Trier and his books, The Benedict Option, have become so popular to traditional Christians. We all need to be looking at ways in which we are going to survive this coming tsunami of secularism and growing Islam. We have to admit that we have lost generations, and we've lost the generations because we have failed to catechize and to teach not only our own young people, but our adults. As I have said for years, as I look at Orthodox parishes in America, we try to teach theology to our kids and let the adults play games. It needs to be flipped around, and we need to seriously get our people's attention, or we're simply going to lose the fight. This is what we now find in the West. So the realignment of Christendom has begun. And we recognize that we have to find answers if we are to preserve the generations, recover those who were lost, and come out on the other side, like Noah, after the flood. Again, Father Alexander orients us back to the Eucharist, when he warns in the preface to his book, The Eucharist, and I quote, Perhaps many people will be astonished that, in response to this crisis, I propose that we turn our attention not to its various aspects, but rather to the sacrament of the Eucharist and to the Church, whose very life flows from that sacrament. Yes, I do believe that precisely here in this Holy of Holies of the Church, in this ascent to the table of the Lord and His Kingdom, is the source of that renewal for which we hope. And I do believe, as the Church has always believed, that this upward journey begins with the laying aside of all earthly cares, with the leaving of this adulterous and sinful world. No ideological fuss and bother, but a gift from heaven. Such is the vocation of the Church in the world." Unquote. We forget who we are. And we forget what God has done, and we must look back in order to find our way forward. Our Christian hagiography overflows with stories of saints and martyrs who dare to speak and challenge the accepted status quo, but it stands in violation of God's law and brings destruction to souls. All of this may seem as something from a distant past, but we in fact are living in a time when the beheading of righteous believers is almost a daily occurrence. Violence against Christians is on the rise. The 20th century produced more martyrs than any other in Christian history. This was especially true in the former Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc countries. In the West, we recognize that the prophetic voice is struggling to be heard in the so-called free world of Western Europe and North America. In our time, we have clearly moved from being a post-Christian society to an aggressively anti-Christian society. Basic social values and moral teachings are being eroded at a very rapid pace. Social media plays an active role where there is little accountability and much influence on a younger generation filled with nuns and dumbs. An anemic Christian voice has also contributed to the rapid pace of this decline. As noted in their book, Resident Aliens, published in 1989, Stanley Harawas and William Willimon wrote, quote, an accommodationist church has little to offer the world, unquote. Churches have failed to teach and preach the faithful who now seem to have their world view formed from the entertainment rather than from theology or the teachings of Christ and His Church. 
John Chrysostom lamented in his day that the people were not in church but in the hippodrome. I asked the question, are we not living with a modern variation of the same scenario? Professor Robert P. George of Princeton University has written regarding the attack on religion and pro family values as follows. Attacks on the family and particularly on the institution of marriage on which the family is built are common in the academy. The line here is that the family, at least as traditionally constituted and understood, is a patriarchal and exploitative institution that oppresses women and imposes on people forms of sexual restraint that are psychologically damaging and that inhibit the free expression of their personality. As has become clear in recent decades, there is a profound threat to the family one against which we must fight with all our energy and will. It is difficult to think of any items on the domestic agenda that is more critical today than the defense of marriage and the union of husband and wife, and the effort to renew and rebuild marriage culture. What has also become clear is that the threats to the family and to the sanctity of human life are necessarily threats to religious freedom and religion itself. At least where the religions in question stand up and speak out for conjugal marriage and the rights of the child in the womb. From the point of view of those seeking to redefine marriage and to protect and advance what they regard as the right to abortion, the taming of religion and the stigmatization and marginalization of religions that refuse to be tamed is a moral imperative." Unquote. This taming of religion has now become an attack from inside the religious households. The drift and decline of mainline Protestant churches is well documented. The dance with the zeitgeist has left these once influential churches in deep numerical decline. Professor Rodney Stark of Baylor University in Texas, in reflection on this fact, has noted, and I quote, the wreckage of the former mainline denominations is strewn upon the shoal of a modernist theology that began to dominate the mainline seminaries early in the 19th century. This theology presumes that advances in human knowledge has made faith outmoded. This theology presumed that advances in human knowledge has made faith outmoded. If religion were to survive, it must become modern and progressive, and the meaning of Christianity should be interpreted from the standpoint of modern knowledge and experience. As the theologian Gary Dorian puts it, from this starting point, science soon took precedence over revelation, and the spiritual realm faded into psychology. Eventually, mainline theologians discarded nearly every doctrinal aspect of traditional Christianity. As the proverbial camel's nose crept further into the tent, so-called conscience clauses were created to alleviate the fears of what is called small O, orthodox faithful in these denominations. Always, in due course, these safeguards are abandoned as the numbers of traditional believers fade. An example is of the, of the of an example is the last of the bishops in the Episcopal Church in the United States who has refused to permit same-sex marriages in his diocese of Albany, New York. Bishop William Love, though he holds to the 2,000-year-old Christian view of marriage, was inhibited and will be tried as a violator of his oath to uphold the doctrine of disciplined worship of the Episcopal Church. His informed conscience and traditional theological views, we are told, can no longer be tolerated in that denomination. This is a perfect example of the referred to taming of religion that is coming. 
The understanding of an informed or educated Christian conscience has become quite muddled, again, from inside the ecclesiastical bodies. Who am I to judge? is often heard from Christian leaders. I am spiritual, but not religious, is cover for people who reject the gospel teachings, but find their own feelings and opinions are the driving force that passes as the rule for following your conscience above all else. Experience, that is of course my personal experience, allows even members of pro-life churches and pro-family churches to find no moral problem with abortion on demand, including the gruesome late-term abortions and same-sex marriage. I was present at the 2014 Erasmus Lecture, sponsored by the magazine First Things, when the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Philadelphia, Archbishop Charles Chaput, declared in his address, quote, on October 6, 2014, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear a variety of state appeals on the nature of marriage. In effect, the court has affirmed the validity of gay marriage, and I believe this creates a tipping point in the American public discourse. The silencing of any privileged voice that biblical belief once had in our public square is just about complete. The most disturbing thing about the debate around gay marriage is the destruction of public reason that it accomplished. Emotion and slobbering drove the argument, and the hatred that infected the conversation come less from so-called homophobes than from any gay issue activists themselves. People who uphold traditional moral architecture for sexuality, marriage, and family have gone in the space of just 20 years from mainstream convictions to the equivalent of racist and bigots, unquote. When Archbishop Chaput made these remarks, it was as if the reality of we have lost suddenly struck the audience. Those words were a marker on the timeline when the question became, how shall we survive as traditional Christians? And how will the next generations be nurtured and formed for what is surely a type of persecution known to the martyrs on whose blood the Church of Christ stands today? U.S. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, writing in his dissent in Oberfeld versus Hodges, that's the decision that made same-sex marriage the law of the land in the U.S., was a prophet in his own right when she saw the Supreme Court's decision as a way to eventually silence, and this is the quote, those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their home. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools, unquote. I might add that many of their churches and their pastors will label them as such as well. Halfway to the future is needed as we are now clearly past the tipping point. In 2017, one halfway was put forward when Rod Greer published The Benedict Option, a strategy for Christians in a post-Christian nation. It caught the attention of a multitude, but it also seems that many missed the point of the message. Some, even those who had not read the book, claimed that Dreher was calling for a retreat into a world of ghetto Christian entities cut off from the real world. I would argue that those critics need to take a closer look at what is being proposed. There is an admission of defeat in battle, but not the war itself. What is being called for is a recognition that a tsunami-like hit on traditional Christians and their teachings values and morals is about to get hard. The small old orthodox needs to be like Noah and prepare an ark to see us through this storm so that we may come out on the other side, ready to start anew when shambles of a cultural collapse comes looking for the truth once again. At the end of his chapter on education as Christian formation, 
He paints the reality of our current situation and what we must do, but he writes the following. Because of florists, bakers, and photographers having been dragged through the courts by gay plaintiffs, we know that some Orthodox Christians will lose their businesses and their livelihoods if they refuse to recognize the new secular Orthodox. We can expect that many more Christians will either be denied employment opportunity by licensing or other professional requirements because they have been driven out of certain workplaces by outright bigotry or by dint of the fact that they cannot in good conscience work in certain fields. What will they do? As you are about to learn, it is not too early for Christians to start asking that question and making plans, unquote. A realignment of traditional Christians across denominational lines seems to be called for. It is an idea that reflects the new ecumenism that Pope Benedict XVI referenced in his pontificate. This idea has caught the attention of groups making formal statements, such as the Manhattan Declaration in 2009. The revival of Orthodox Christianity in Russia has also seen an interesting comment, has always also seen as an interest in finding common traditional Christian values as a platform for a united witness. Speaking in 2010, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow said the following, Christians have to find new languages and new creative ways of preaching. Christian values in today's continuously changing world. To enable this preaching to be heard and properly understood, the sphere of culture is the area in which constructive dialogue between the church and society can be the most effective. And I see here an opportunity for fruitful cooperation between Christians of all traditional values. In the first place, I mean the cooperation between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches, which have a common social and economic view of the pressing problems of social and economic ethics, bioethics, the family, and personal morality. Our common Christian tradition, commitment to dialogue, and readiness for cooperation can and must become a driving mechanism of usual rapprochement. In conclusion, it is clear that the eleventh hour is now upon us, and the time to act is urgent. In our history as Christians, we can reflect upon a pattern of a 500-year cycle of crisis, beginning with the fall of Rome and the Dark Ages, with the great schism of 1054, followed by the Protestant Reformation 500 years later. In our day, we are now in yet another time of cultural collapse and chaos. Christians are divided. In a time of martyrdom has begun yet again. Matters of faith and conscience demand our attention as individuals and corporately by those who know Christ as Lord and Savior. In his testimony, our Lord says that things will be seen through all dark times. When we read the following from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 11 and 12. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. You say, I'm Scott. Die Barbara de Gaunus hat Herr Fields mit Pico Guavesa Zeit der Sonne auf seine Beigung, Adamia Issa Romelitsa. Tapi kebuli ya, beli problem itu saat si tahu cuman as kuat sukses dah problem macam sedikit macam sedikit lewat, ada macam lewat ni, ada macam ni.
Thank <laughs> you. 